Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Welcome to the 2019 Astro Awards. Now, this is a time where we reflect on all the exciting things that happened throughout the year in spaceflight and space discoveries. Of course, these aren't anything official, for now. This is just a time to look back on all the awesome science, discoveries, engineering, and achievements made by humans in the last year. So we took polls here on YouTube, Twitter, and Reddit for your favorite missions, and now we get to soak them all in. Now we do place these in an order, and I put the most weight on how you actually voted in the polls. But at the end of the day, I get to say on what actually goes where, because I said so. So without further ado, may I present to you the 2019 Astro Awards. Hello and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the third annual Astro Awards, the night of the biggest stars. Yes, of course, even including UI Scuddy, Beetlejuice, VY Canis Majoris, and even NML Signy made it. Wow, aren't they beautiful? And yes, I'm going to make the same stupid joke every year, so you better get used to it. Each year, we pick our favorite space moments and award the winner the much-coveted Leo Award. Brand new edition this year. That's definitely not just a bunch of leftover, uh, probably highly toxic rockets that I got off Alibaba that are supposed to be about three times bigger and not have the word astronaut printed on the side. Yeah, they're definitely custom for this event. They're the coveted awards. Very special. Obviously. Okay, now I swear someday these will be legit awards made and we'll actually give them out to the people involved in these programs and maybe we'll try to invite them together and actually do this thing live. Maybe 2020 will be the year when I actually have a team behind me. The Astro Awards is a chance as the general public to lift up, celebrate, and thank those who dedicate their lives to furthering our knowledge and understanding of the universe that we live in. And 2019 was another super exciting year for spaceflight and space science. Although it wasn't as jam-packed with launches as 2018, and we didn't get to see humans flying on the commercial crew program from U.S. soil, or as Jim Bridenstine would say, American astronauts on American rockets from American soil. But it still brought us a lot of really cool things. And again, we're actually going to put these in order leading up to what's kind of the most significant event of 2019 according to our polls. But don't put too much weight on the order in the end of the day. It's really all just for fun and to recognize those who work so hard. Not only do we factor in scientific significance, but we also factor in cultural impact because that's a really good gauge on how excited the general public is. So. Keep that in mind when we're going through this list. And before we get started, let's take a few moments to reflect on and remember some great people, missions, and programs that we had to say goodbye to this year, starting with a few important people who made an impact in space history. loved ones this year, our thoughts and prayers are with you. Their work has helped shape the industry, expanded our horizons as humans, and has literally changed our understanding of our place amongst the stars. They'll be forever remembered and their legacies will live on. So thank you. And although not even close to as tragic as losing a loved one, we did see the end of some missions and hardware, planned or not, that I thought would be worth sending off.
saw a lot of crazy stuff happen this year. We said goodbye to the Delta IV medium, as it'll only be flying in the heavy configuration from now on. The moon was a big old bully this year, which we'll talk a little bit more about here in a second. And SpaceX lost quite a bit of hardware. I mean, those poor Falcon Heavy cores just can't catch a break, can they? I think the biggest heartbreak was the Arabsat center core that totally landed successfully, but was lost at rough seas. <laughs> I mean, come on. But hopefully we won't see that happen again since SpaceX's little core holding robot, the Octagrabber, is now able to hold Falcon Heavy cores as well as Falcon 9 cores. And even though we sent Opportunity off in last year's Astro Awards, how can you not say goodbye one last time? Especially when it's last when his last words were, my battery is running low and it's getting dark. <laughs> okay, well, we've got a lot to talk about from 2019. So let's start off this year's show with some honorable mentions. <laughs> The U.S. Air Force's secret little Boeing X-37B orbital test vehicle completed its fifth mission on October 27, 2019, after spending a record-breaking 780 days on orbit. While we know very little about what it's doing up there, it's super cool to see a vehicle spend so much time on orbit and just return safely like it's no big deal. Humans have been doing spacewalks for 54 years now, and unbelievably, it took until 2019 for two women to be assigned a mission together. So thank you, Jessica Meir and Christina Cook, for getting out there and replacing a battery charge slash discharge unit. You two rock, and it's about time this happened so we could set a good example for everyone everywhere. In an attempt to win the Lunar X Prize, Israel Space Industries and Space IL built a washing machine sized 150 kilogram lander that was hoping to be the first privately funded spacecraft to softly land on the moon. And although unfortunately a gyroscope inside the inertial measurement unit failed during the approach, which caused it to land a little too fast, Okay, way too fast at 139 meters per second vertically and 947 meters per second horizontally, which ended up turning the lander into an unintentional impactor. Small details here, but it was still a very impressive feat and made Israel only the fourth country to attempt a soft landing on the moon and made the Beersheet lander the first private vehicle to orbit the moon. The moon was a big old meanie this year, destroying another lunar lander as it attempted a soft touchdown. This time it was India's Chandrayaan 2 that fell subject, and unfortunately it maybe watched the Beersheet lander a little too closely and wound up doing something eerily similar, and it too became an unintentional impactor, hitting the surface at 50 meters per second. Had it been successful, it would have made India only the fourth country to do a soft landing on the moon. And although this wasn't the first time India touched the moon, as Chandrayaan 1, which was an intentional lunar impactor, already accomplished that feat in 2008. Overall, it was an awfully impressive mission considering it was entirely run by ISRO. I mean, the launch vehicle was ISRO's own vehicle. I mean, everything was done in-house for an astonishingly cheap price of around 141 million US dollars. And importantly, the orbiter that was also part of the mission is still successful. So we look forward to Chandrayaan-3, which is already being built and will hopefully launch at the end of 2020. This year, the Planetary Society launched an entirely crowdfunded spacecraft for the second time that can ride solar radiation and solar wind to actually change its orbit. It flew on SpaceX's Falcon Heavy STP-2 mission and has successfully raised its orbit using just photons from the sun. The LightSail project is an awesome technology demonstrator, and it's even cooler that it's crowdfunded by people like me and you. Now we talked all about the awesome Hayabusa 2 mission from JAXA in last year's Astro Awards, but this year they did something so freaking awesome with it, I just had to mention it quick. Hayabusa 2 shot asteroid Ryugu with a copper projectile that was packed with explosives. So yeah, Japan's out there shooting asteroids in 2019. What'd you do this year? Okay, so those are just a few little honorable mentions that I wanted to throw out there quick. So now let's get on with our main events. STP-2 was perhaps one of the most complex missions ever, period. I'm dead serious. I know this sounds like a bunch of hyperbole, 
But seriously, here's what had to happen for this mission to actually be successful. SpaceX put 24 separate spacecrafts on a Falcon Heavy rocket and then put them into three wildly different orbits and required a total of four separate upper stage burns. And meanwhile, they recovered over half the rocket while pushing it to the extreme upper limits of what's physically possible for the Falcon Heavy. But perhaps most nutty of all is this mission actually required the success of the Arabsat 6A Falcon Heavy mission from earlier that year in order to actually reuse those side boosters in a timely manner. Now, I know this doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but honestly, this mission was a masterpiece in mission planning, required several pirouettes of deployments, and overall, it was a magnum opus of what SpaceX is capable of doing. The only thing that went wrong, but was kind of considered a Hail Mary anyway, was the landing of the center core. Now, unfortunately, the intense mission profile demanded just a little too much Delta V, leaving the center core with really no buffer for a successful landing. The center core ended up having to re-enter just a little too spicy, which ended up overheating the thrust vector control system that actually steers the engine, and the rocket ended up missing the drone ship. Now, in a world where SpaceX seems to nail almost every single landing in the past three years, it did seem like kind of a major loss. But in a world where every other rocket still just crashes into the ocean, SpaceX did something unbelievably impressive with the STP-2 mission. So congrats to the team that helped orchestrate this mission that was easily one of the most impressive missions I've ever watched. This is one of those scientific events that I think went a little under the radar, but for the first time, researchers detected water vapor signatures on an exoplanet 124 light years away. First discovered in 2015 by NASA's Kepler Space Telescope, K218b is a super Earth, eight times larger than our own planet, orbiting a red dwarf star. The researchers then used data from the Hubble Space Telescope to analyze the host star's light shining through the atmosphere of the planet and published their findings in 2019. The results showed the molecular signature of water vapor, hydrogen, and helium. It's just absolutely bonkers to me that we can observe water vapor on a planet that's over 100 light years away. With eight times the surface gravity of Earth and higher radiation levels as well, it likely wouldn't be a very habitable planet for humans, that is, if we could ever get there. But it is still extremely exciting to know that water exists on these distant exoplanets. Because, you know, where there's water, there very well may be life. Congrats to the astronomers at the Center for Space Exochemistry Data at the University College London and the teams at NASA and ESA who run Hubble for bringing us these exciting findings. <laughs> So these awards usually go to specific missions, discoveries, and big awesome events. But what happens when there's a company that just hits the ground sprinting and does so many things in a year, you end up with your head spinning? Well, that's exactly what Rocket Lab ended up doing in 2019. Not only did they double their launch cadence from three launches a year to six, which is impressive in itself for only their second year of launching operationally, but they also managed to develop a satellite bus slash kickstage and open up a second launch pad. But that's not all. Perhaps the most exciting thing they worked on this year was reusing their Electron rockets, bringing them into an extremely elite club. Their first test of recovery showed an even better than expected re-entry. That's awesome. 2020 will likely be an even bigger year for them. With plans to launch once a month, we'll see Photon fly, and we might even watch them recover a rocket with a freaking helicopter. <laughs> this is just one of those companies that helps make spaceflight so exciting to watch. Be sure and check out my interview with Rocket Lab CEO Peter Beck when I asked him all about the recovery efforts while sitting like two kids in a treehouse on their brand new launch pad in Virginia. Peter is easily one of the coolest guys in the space industry, and he definitely was one of the coolest guys on that day because it was almost freezing. Rocket Lab, I've got my eyes on you. Fantastic year, fantastic progress, and you're truly doing an amazing job of bringing us spaceflight fans along for the ride. Seriously, I love how much you share with the general public and your quality of coverage. I mean, it just makes it extra fun for us to cheer you on. 2019 was the year we finally got to see NASA's commercial crew vehicles come to life with two orbital test flights. Now granted, these were uncrewed flights, unfortunately, 
I just really thought this was gonna be the year that we we're going to see human spaceflight return to the United States. But regardless, we saw two brand new spacecraft fly this year. First, we saw SpaceX's Crew Dragon capsule launch for DM-1 on March 2nd, 2019. It was just a picture-perfect launch, a perfect landing of the booster, docking the Dragon spacecraft to the International Space Station, and eventually a re-entry and a perfect splashdown. It was so picture-perfect, in fact, that even won SpaceX and NASA an Emmy. Yeah, I didn't know that was possible either. Now, although SpaceX wound up losing that particular capsule just a month later during a test of its Super Draco abort motors, SpaceX did end the year with a successful and rigorous test of their Mark III parachutes by completing 10 successful drop tests in a row. Now, they're finally on track to finish certification by doing a launch abort test, and then, hopefully soon after, getting crew on board for DM2. Boeing also ended the year by testing their Starliner capsule and successfully returning it for a bullseye landing two days later. Now, I'm sure you all know it had a clock error after separation of the spacecraft and the rocket that eventually led to docking with the space station being aborted. But I like to remind people that they successfully demonstrated everything else critical on the spacecraft besides the actual docking and a few little things involved in that. Perhaps most importantly, they demonstrated re-entry and a perfect bullseye landing, despite that initial off nominal insertion burn. Now I know the internet was really quick to pin blame on Boeing and be critical of the Starliner spacecraft, but remember, first off, SpaceX had a failure this year as well, but really more importantly, remember there are individual people who have been working maybe years on these programs who are just doing their absolute best. And when something doesn't go right for any company, when the internet gets their pitchforks out, all it does is rub salt in the wounds, you know, for those people who are already stinging from their mission failure. I have a lot of friends that work at SpaceX and Boeing and other spaceflight companies who have experienced losses or missions that just didn't quite go as planned. And trust me, they have a lot more pressure on themselves and inside the company to right the wrong than any of us people on the internet could really ever understand. So have a little grace. And remember people, these are the Astro Awards and we're here to celebrate what went right. And quite frankly, a lot did go right on the Starliner mission and virtually every system got put through its paces. And although we didn't get to see people flying in 2019, we're really looking good for an incredible 2020 when humans should finally launch from the United States for the first time since 2011. It's a good thing Soyuz is still online to be able to get us into space. <laughs> Where else would we be without it right now? So congrats to NASA, Boeing, and SpaceX on a year of progress, learning from failures, and winding up with a safer and more robust vehicle for the next generation of astronauts. This year we saw something pretty nutty happen, and quite frankly, kind of controversial. The first phase of a global low latency high speed internet constellation. Let's talk about it quick and I'll tell you why it's so important and why it definitely deserves a place on this year's Astro Awards. SpaceX launched their first full batch of 60 Starlink satellites on a single Falcon 9 on May 24th, 2019. This was remarkable, not only for the density and sheer number of large satellites that they were launched in a single launch, but also by designing a satellite constellation around their launch vehicle to perfectly utilize the Falcon 9. After all, they're putting the Falcon 9 through its paces with each and every one of these missions, and even cooler, on the second full batch of Starlink, well, technically the first operational flight, on November 11th, SpaceX used the booster for the fourth time, and they reused fairings for the first time ever. Oh yeah, let's not forget that SpaceX caught a fairing this year as well, and then they even reflew another set. Because these satellites are built by SpaceX, they're the customer and the launch provider, which means we'll see them push the vehicle harder and harder, and we'll hopefully see them learn even more and more about the reusability plans and turnaround times for the Falcon 9. But the overall concept of global low latency high speed internet is honestly profound. Now, you might think this is some like hippy dippy Silicon Valley save the world type speech, but hear me out. 
Access to information is the way our species has grown, evolved, problem solved, and developed economies. There's always been a divide between the wealthy or educated and the unwealthy and uneducated. Starting way, way back, valuing information and ideas is what helped make the Greek, Roman, Ottoman, and other empires thrive. Or think of it like when the printing press helped disseminate information that was otherwise reserved only for the ultra wealthy. There was even a time where people who owned encyclopedias were literally considered well to do because they could not only afford the whole book set, but also had access to the information within at the tips of their fingers. And nowadays we still live in a time where not everyone has access to the internet, whether it be because of socioeconomic divides or politically fueled firewalls. Those who have unfiltered access to the internet can literally do anything. I mean, just look at YouTube. Here you are, likely an average person with no formal connection to anything aerospace, or astrophysics related, and yet you're learning information about it right now. Or you can be someone who literally teaches themselves to program and build their own model rockets that can, I don't know, propulsively land when you have access to the internet. Isn't that right, Joe Barnard? Once Starlink is fully rolled out, you can be pretty much anywhere on the planet Earth, for now just Earth, and have full high-speed access to the internet. I mean, just like how cell phone adoption leapfrogged landlines in rural areas around the world, this will hopefully be another leapfrog moment that lowers the physical and the economic barriers of entry to the internet as well. Of course, there's some controversy of space debris and a real serious potential of interfering with Earth-based astronomical observations. But personally, I think this will open more doors than it closes, including a future of cheaper and more readily available space-based astronomy options as well. But for now, I just wanted to give credit where credit is due for a massive, massive leap into the future. The teams at SpaceX have done something really remarkable here, and it might take a bit for all of us to be able to actually reap the benefits, but mark my words, this is a game changer for the future of humanity. This one almost snuck into last year's Astro Award since it happened on January 1st, but this was an up close glimpse of a Kuiper Belt object known as 2014 MU69 or slash Ultima Thule. The New Horizons spacecraft that brought us those same stunning images of Pluto in 2015 was precisely guided by its mission control navigators to fly by Ultima Thule to an accuracy of within 1% of its closest approach aim points of 3,500 kilometers after a 3.5 year coast and 1.6 billion kilometers traveled. The farthest exploration of a celestial body ever brought us these stunning images with this like snowman kind of thing with lots of ice, which shocked the scientific world. The images and data brought back helps provide glimpses into the very earliest days of our solar system. This is the first binary object to ever be directly observed up close and personal like this. What's even more exciting is we're still getting the data back from that flyby today, a year later, and we'll continue to get more data until the end of 2020 from just that single quick flyby. And as if that's not enough, because the engineers navigating the spacecraft nailed the flyby so perfectly, there's a good chance they have enough propellant to explore another Kuiper Belt object even further away, which is absolutely amazing. This is one of those things that made its rounds and had a profound public impact. I mean, who would have guessed that this tiny, tiny faint object only 33 kilometers long would be so unique looking and would offer us such a rare glimpse of how our solar system was actually created. Great work to the teams at John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, Southwest Research Institute, and NASA. We can't wait to see what else New Horizons can discover. Chang'e 4 also barely missed the 2018 Astro Awards because it successfully touched down on the moon on January 3rd, 2019. But why is this a big deal? Why is landing on the moon anywhere near the top of our list? Well, there's actually quite a few reasons. First off, this was the first object anyone has ever sent to the far side of the moon. It's absolutely crazy to me that it took until 2019 to explore the other half of the moon. And not only that, it landed near the south pole of the moon too, which is where we recently have discovered water ice. 
Chengi 4 also took with it a small biosphere with cotton seeds, oil seeds, and a, a few other things that were actually germinated and grown for the first time on another world. I actually think this might be one of the coolest things to happen. I mean, just because it's a pretty exciting look at potentially growing food on other worlds. China is also the only country to soft land on the moon since 1976. Yep, you heard that right. Chang'e 3 and Chang'e 4 are the only things sitting on the moon in one piece with electronics more advanced than this. It just seems insane to me that we basically just stopped exploring our nearest celestial neighbor after the space race. In order to pull this mission off, Chinese National Space Agency, or CNSA, had to first launch a relay satellite that would allow for communication and data relay to the spacecraft on the far side of the moon. Then they actually did something that I'm even more excited about collaborated. This mission marked the first time NASA and CNSA worked together since the 2011 congressional ban. The Chinese scientists requested NASA observe landing plumes with the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and each agency shared locations of their satellites in orbit of the moon. Personally, this kind of cooperation makes me really happy. I mean, China has been doing some incredible things really quickly in spaceflight. I definitely would rather the international space community work together and help foster a healthy relationship than to have China just go rogue. It'd really be a shame. Since Chang'e 4 is the first to observe mantle materials and potentially lunar crust, the scientific data they're observing is priceless. The mission has already held so much promise and is leading way for Chang'e 5, which will be China's first lunar return sample mission. Now, that's gonna be awesome. But lastly, with China home to almost 20% of the human population, these Chang'e missions are inspiring a new generation and audience to explore space. China is putting huge investments into science and space exploration, and in my opinion, that can become a huge positive feedback loop. I mean, just look at what happened in the United States after the Apollo era. Having a generation of engineers and scientists working to get humans to the moon, now spilling out into the workforce and having kids grow up watching humans walk on the moon definitely helped put the United States in the front of the technical innovations of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So hold on folks, China is doing a lot of awesome exploration. They're doing things that have never been done before and actually pushing the boundaries. So great work to the teams at the China National Space Administration for an impressive feat in exploring what shockingly has not yet been explored. I want more missions to the moon, P please. <laughs> There's just seriously so much more to explore. So good job. Water towers can fly. This is the one spaceflight event that broke my brain a little too much and made me scream like a little child. I spent a total of over a month in Texas in 2019 just hoping to catch the flights of SpaceX's Starhopper, and that's their Starship prototype vehicle. This, of course, is the 20 meter tall, nine meter wide flying water tower powered by the world's most advanced rocket engine in the world, SpaceX's full flow stage combustion cycle methane powered Raptor engine. So a metal trash can can fly 150 meters. What's the big deal? Why is this anywhere near the top of our list? Honestly, yeah, I don't really know. But you guys quite frankly loved it, and so did I. And it did garner a lot of attention, and although that's maybe not the most scientifically important spaceflight reason to do things, I'll tell you why it does deserve to be near the top of our list, but not at the very top. Starhopper honestly represents a massive fundamental shift in how you build rockets. It set a new benchmark for rapid iteration and prototyping. That little ugly water tower metal flying thing was built from scratch in less than six months out in the open in a field in Texas for what could be estimated at only a few million dollars worth of parts and labor. Compare that to how rockets are typically designed and iterated on. SpaceX is tapping into a design philosophy I thought was lost after the initial space race. The Soviet Union tended to rapidly build things, test them until they break, and repeat. SpaceX actually took a full flow stage combustion cycle engine and performed work with it. And although it's just a little work, getting off of a test stand and getting some actual flight time is a huge step. 
This is important as it helps SpaceX begin to learn how to fuel up a methane powered vehicle, learn and validate you know, what it takes to ignite the engine and how to throttle and control it for flight. There's, I mean, just a lot of little things that add up to a pretty big milestone in the Starship program. Yeah, there's still a ways away from an actual all up orbital Starship in my opinion, but seeing them hit the ground sprinting with Starhopper and the entire Boca Chica site was a massively important pedal to the metal excitathon. Why this isn't at the very top of our list is because in the grand scheme of things, this isn't that different from SpaceX's Grasshopper or their F9R vehicle. Sure, it's more advanced, but with only two tiny hops before it retired, its program was really short and quite limited. Or you could think of it like the flying bedstead of the Apollo era. It taught NASA and their Apollo astronauts quite a bit, but in the grand scheme of the program, it's just a tiny little test bed vehicle. But what I do think is important is how much this plucky little squatty rocket powered trash can actually inspired the general public again. You know, piqued their interest and got more people asking questions and following along. In the long run, I think that's one of the most important things an aerospace company can do. So again, great job to the teams at SpaceX who not only made massive, massive leaps with the Raptor engine this year, but also broke some records, built a rocket in the horrible South Texas heat and inspired people to start paying extra close attention to the progress being made. How do you take a picture of something that by definition doesn't emit any light? Isn't that quite literally impossible? Well, that's what was the general consensus when it came to photographing a black hole. So let me ask again, how do you take a picture of something that emits no light? Well, you obviously can't take a picture of the object itself, but you can try and get images of the hot gases as they fall into the black hole. And that's exactly what the international team who makes up the Event Horizons Telescope did. In order to pull off images of an extremely faint light 53 million light years away, it requires an unbelievably sensitive imaging system with a huge, huge, huge lens, essentially. And by huge, I mean a lens as big as the Earth. That's right. Teams used smaller telescopes from all around the world, spanning quite literally the diameter of the Earth, and focused them on a black hole in the galaxy M87. This is equivalent to photographing an orange on the surface of the moon from the surface of the Earth. In order to calibrate each of the eight telescopes involved in what became known as the EHT or Event Horizon Telescope, scientists had to synchronize with each other to within a fraction of a millimeter using atomic clocks locked onto a GPS time standard. Sound complicated? Yeah, it was. They recorded data for four days straight. A lot of data, actually. So much data, they didn't even bother transferring it via the internet because it'd just simply take too long. So the teams physically transported around five petabytes of data to a central location. Yeah, that's crazy. So why is taking a picture of a black dot with a little reddish ring around it a big deal in the first place? Well, because it was the first direct observation of a black hole, this gave scientists a lot of data to confirm theories about black holes and even lend additional credit to Einstein's theory of general relativity. This data helps shed insight on how black holes are formed and how they behave. I mean, there's been hypotheses about black holes for decades, but this is the first time there's really been anything to confirm or support them. For me, this was another massive win for space support and awareness. The internet and news outlets went nuts when these images were released. It again, really helped inspire people and helped have a tiny little glimpse of the absurdities that surround us in the cosmos. I think images like this tell a story, but coolest of all, they don't tell the whole story. They just open the book and beg for more to be written. When someone sees an image like this, it raises questions. It starts conversations and it gets gears turning. I think this is maybe one of the most famous space images since Hubble's famous Pillars of Creation picture. Or maybe when Hubble was aimed at what was supposed to be a pretty empty portion of the night sky only to discover it's literally full of galaxies. Yeah, it's stuff like that that has really lasting impressions. It's images like this, the techniques used for the Event Horizon Telescope and the precision required for this feat that's going to clearly mark a new chapter of observing our universe. 
I mean, I can't wait to see what else we can discover and observe when we come together and collaborate. Using the Earth as a giant telescope is really the embodiment of why I think space exploration matters. As I always say, space is the border we all share. When humans explore the universe, we leave petty tribalism behind. It's no longer this city versus that city. It's no longer this state versus that state, this team versus that team, or even this country versus that country. It's humans going and exploring together. It's the border we all share. We leave politics and division behind because when we explore the universe, we explore it together, furthering our knowledge as a species. So when humans go and explore space, it becomes humans versus the universe. So huge congratulations to the international team that's literally far too long to list. This is what I love to see. International collaboration, doing what was literally considered impossible and developing techniques that will further shape our knowledge. Man, oh man, what a crazy year we had. I'm still in utter shock of what I got to be able to do this year as well too. I mean, my stickers got sent to the International Space Station which was literally a shock to me. I had no idea. So thanks to astronaut Luca Parmitano for shooting some pictures of them just hanging out on the International Space Station. I literally almost dropped my phone when I had that email come through. I was also fortunate enough to catch Starhopper fly both times. I got to interview Elon Musk, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein, and Rocket Lab's Peter Beck. Then Elon was spotted sporting my full flow stage combustion cycle shirt in the Cybertruck with Edward Norton and casually mentioned it's one of his favorite shirts on Twitter. So that ruled. <laughs> I got to go inside the International Space Station mock-up in Johnson Space Center as well. I even had my biggest meetup ever on a Thursday night in Vienna, Austria, which absolutely blew me away. I definitely want to do a European speaking tour someday. I'm extremely proud that I produced two of my longest, most detailed, and most researched videos to date about the Raptor engine and about aerospikes this year as well. And I couldn't do it without you. Seriously, without those of you who watch, subscribe, comment, like, say hi, encourage me, cheer me up, teach me something, correct me, and financially support what I do. You're the reason I keep upgrading my equipment and spend weeks in Texas waiting for a water tower to take off, fly to Virginia, Texas, California to interview people in the industry, and even spend months researching and learning for myself so that I can make the best videos I possibly can make. I'm honestly just absolutely floored by the response of this community. You guys are incredible, and I'm truly living my dream life right now. 2020 is going to be a huge year, I promise. Just wait and see what I've got in store. The Everyday Astronaut team will officially be growing to more than just me working full time to hopefully a small team by the end of 2020, so I can actually produce more quality content more often. And hopefully with a full-time team behind me, I could actually be able to do something like the Astro Awards live in 2020. You know, like actually invite members of these teams out to, you know, present them with a real award and not some plastic toxic rocket thing that says astronaut. <laughs> then we could maybe help pay for their travel and lodging through like GoFundMe or something like that. Let me know if you think that'd be a good idea. I have really wanted to do it this year, but just when I'm working on the stuff by myself, it became physically impossible. 2020, I've got a nice clear path. I think we can make it happen. What do you think? So thanks again, of course, to my Patreon supporters who made 2019 a huge year for me, you know, for helping me do as much as I possibly can do. If you want to help me do what I do, please consider becoming a Patreon member where you'll gain access to our exclusive subreddit, our Discord channel, and exclusive live streams by visiting patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. Thank you guys so much, seriously. And while you're online, of course, be sure and check out my web store, which is another really fun way to support what I do. Uh, you can even grab what apparently is Elon Musk's favorite shirt, the Full Flow Stage Combustion Cycle shirt, which is also now a hoodie. And be sure and check out the Rapid Unscheduled discount section as well, where you can pick up merchandise for really, really cheap, good prices while supplies last. So that's everydayastronaut.com shop. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.